The flight crew really does make all the difference. I could just stop it right there. Hi there, my name is Kevin and I make honest, unsponsored, and to the point narrated video tours about hotels and flights all over the world. This is my 95th video and today we're finishing up my 30 hour journey to Singapore on board a Q-Suite equipped A350-1000. I hope you'll stick around and come along for the rest of the journey. Welcome to Doha's bright and shiny Hamad International Airport. This is the second leg in my journey that started around 16 hours ago in Philly. If you'd like to know more about the exact fare that I paid as well as my next five videos in queue, trust me, there are some really good ones coming. Please check out the description below. So originally, I was supposed to have a three hour layover in Doha, a layover that I was ironically a bit bummed about because it wasn't a bit longer. I'm weird, I know. Well, wouldn't you know it that Qatar Airways is here to make your dreams come true because they decided to cancel my original flight and load us all onto another existing flight scheduled for six hours later. Do you know who else is in the business of making dreams come true? Not me, but that seemed like a great segue. But now that I've got you, let me give you a 10 second history. Before 2020, I spent years building a restaurant business in Vietnam. Then COVID came, that ended, and now here I am some 16 months after having edited my first ever video. Time flies. So when I say that I'd really appreciate your thumbs up on this video and a subscription, it's the absolute truth. It really does make a difference. Also, I have a new Patreon if you're interested, link down below. And as always, my ears are wide open if you have any comments, suggestions, or nicely worded criticisms. So as you can probably already see, we are in the expansive Al Morjan Business Class Lounge. This wasn't my original plan though. You see, the Al Safwa First Class Lounge sells entry for around $160 to business class passengers. Considering all that the lounge offers, for me, it would have been money well spent for six of those nine hours of the layover. Wouldn't you know it though? You can only buy access if you bought your ticket directly through Qatar Airways. And guess what? I didn't. So here we are. Not complaining, this is a fantastic lounge, but yeah, two lounges are always better than one. I had three priorities here, well, four I guess. Two meals, a shower, and some way, somehow, sleep. I landed at around 6pm and didn't sleep at all on the flight over. Step one, a small meal. So I headed over to what I'm going to call the fancy sandwich shop. It was a nice and open space with a lot of people in it. In fact, that's a theme in this lounge. A whole lot of people, everywhere, always. The sandwich, by the way, was okay. Nothing special. While I was eating, I was trying to plan out a way to sleep and remembered that there's a quiet zone conveniently located just behind the sandwich shop. The showers are also back here. So in this area, with the high ceilings and the dull waves of snoring all around you, kind of gave you the sense that you were sleeping in a museum, equipped with a few dozen of these pods or relaxing rooms. They're strictly first come first serve and relatively speaking, there aren't that many of them. When I walked up to the counter, the agent verified the length of my layover. I think it needs to be over five hours or more to gain access. He told me that there was only one available, but it didn't have a couch. It only had two chairs. Well, I didn't even know that they had couches, but instantly I wanted a couch. Anyway, I took it and after a little while, eventually made, I guess, my own couch. There were no pillows available, which was a bit odd, but they did have some blankets. I stayed in the room for around five hours, two of which I slept. After that, it was definitely time for a shower. The shower suites were nice, clean and spacious with diptyque amenities. It certainly got the job done. Step one, two and three complete. Now it's on to the main restaurant on the other side of the lounge, sitting above the gorgeous reflecting pool. Spotted the American 777, which began service to Doha from JFK just about a week prior, and tried to make sense of the mayhem that this restaurant was. It had a small buffet line served by chefs. There was a made-to-order sushi bar that you ordered from and then needed to explain somehow to the very patient staff which table you were at since there were no numbers on the tables. There was a self-service area with grab-and-go packaged bites 
And then there was a sit down restaurant with a proper menu. Did I mention this is all in the exact same room? After searching for a few minutes, I was happily led by one of the staff to a pretty far away, nice small booth overlooking the apron. I went up and ordered some sushi and ordered a main from the a la carte menu, enjoyed with a glass of sparkling rosé. I'll say that the food was well-intentioned and beautiful, but not the best execution. Had the filet not been butterflied and cooked seemingly for days, it probably would have been great. But of course, this is all still much better than the vast majority of business class lounges out there. So this is not complaining. It was time to head to the gate. So here's one thing that perhaps not everyone knows. During the pandemic, Qatar Airways essentially did the opposite of every other airline. While everyone else was reducing flights, staff, and destinations, Qatar purposely leaned into COVID. They kept every route that they could keep open, open. I remember when in lockdown in Saigon, Qatar and Singapore Airlines were really the only two international airlines that kept up with daily service. And so their fiscal year, which just recently closed, saw a record profit for the airline. And now, in June 2022, when this was filmed, the airport is as busy as ever and still functioning very well. Boarding passes are scanned on entry into the gate area, but interestingly, there's absolutely no transit security for passengers, at least from the US. We were just let free into the terminal. The seats inside the boarding area were in, I believe, eight zones. Premium, handicapped, and then zone one through six. The zones were laid out in the order in which you would board. Boarding was on time, and we made our way down to the aircraft, a three-year-old A350-1000. Today's early morning flight would be departing around 30 minutes late and bring us up to a cruising altitude of 35,000 feet for this 3,800 mile journey to Changi, where we'd be landing five minutes ahead of schedule. So just a few days ago, I posted a video that went into detail about every single little nook and cranny of the seat. That was on my flight from Philly. Today, I'm gonna show you everything, but I'm gonna focus on the primary differences between this aircraft and flight and the previous one. I was in two Bravo today, a window seat, but one that is closer to the aisle. As soon as you walk in, especially after coming from a 777, one thing is pretty clear. Q suites are pretty tight in an A350. Let's take a closer look at the details. The 1000 variants have 46 Q suites spread over two cabins. For the seats to avoid, 100%, it's all about row number one, especially the window seats due to the curvature of the fuselage and the angle of the aisles. All of these seats are noticeably smaller than the standard Q suites, and these on the A350 are already a bit smaller than on the 777. Essentially, these suites are an inch narrower in almost every direction. By my own measurements, the seat width and depth are both an inch less and it was the same with the suite width itself. The only area that's a little bit bigger is the length of the bed, which is about five inches longer at its longest point, but the footwell is also narrower. Individually, these measurements really don't make that much of a difference, but when you have a pretty high door that closes, you, you can feel it a little bit. The cabin did feel a bit more open though without the overhead middle bins. So besides being directly next to the window versus directly next to the aisle, the biggest difference in the seats is whether or not you have a corner nook seating area. You can see the armrest area difference between the two. Otherwise, the seats and amenities are essentially the same as the 777 flight. Similar diptyque amenity kit, though this time it came in a leatherish pouch instead of a gift box. For the pre-flight drink, I enjoyed one of their signature mint lemonades, which was very refreshing, especially with an ice cold towel. Seat controls are near identical, except the remote here is the newest generation. 
and while the armrest here is much larger, it functions the same way. Pajamas are handed out, and the decent noise-canceling headphones were already at the seat. Thankfully, plenty of air vents, but only for the window passengers. Some of the other controls, like the crew call button, are located under the IFE monitor, along with the USB port. The content was exactly the same with hundreds of choices of all sorts of content. Pushback came, and it kind of felt like we were the last ones to leave, and in reality it's kind of true. Only around 10 more flights were left in the 1-3am to 3 bank. A pretty short taxi brought us to line up for our takeoff to the north. The line up, spool up, and take off are next. Let me briefly talk about the service on this flight. Had I not just had the best crew that I've ever had on the flight prior, this probably would have seemed pretty good. But there was absolutely no comparison. Everyone on this flight did their jobs correctly, and they were polite. But every single moment of the flight, they were rushing around as if they were understaffed by half. I'm talking like literally running at two points. Our route this morning was pretty straightforward, mostly following the direct route. For the first meal service, whatever you'd like to call a 3am meal, I did a bit of a strange pick and choose. I started off with a glass of Sauvignon Blanc as we passed over Dubai and I got my Netflix going. By the way, I wasn't streaming, but I could have been. Wi-Fi on this flight was an easy peasy 10 bucks for the full flight. Feel free to pause the menu to take a closer look. Note, the red prices on the wines are just a sampling of current prices selling in the US. So, I started off by asking them to reserve one of the breakfast main dishes for me for prior to landing, which they did kindly do. All food service on Qatar Business Class is a la carte anytime dining. So, I started with one of the breakfast starters, a so-called asiet of cold cuts. I had no idea what it is, so I had to look it up. It just means plate. It included smoked balik salmon, smoked mackerel, caper berry, goat cheese, and an egg mimosa. I'll say it was delicious and easily the most beautiful cold cut plate that I've ever seen in the sky. But there was just a lot of really strong flavors going on here. Each on their own were delicious though. I followed that up with something that actually put a smile on my face as they put the plate down because it smelled and looked so good. This was one of the light options, a hot pot pulled oxtail open sandwich on toasted brioche. And it was everything that all hot pot pulled oxtail dreams are made of. After that, I made the unusual choice, for me at least, of a cardamom chai which hit the spot. A quick trip to the bathroom found a nice sized compartment with its own window, but cleanliness standards were nowhere near the attention to detail as on the previous flight. Here's a look at the bed in full flat mode. Mattress pads weren't provided proactively on this flight and I didn't see any in the overhead bins. Again, the seat is longer, but you can see how narrow it does get. Unfortunately, similar to the 777 though, is the fact that this seat also does not lie completely flat. There's always a little bit of an angle at the head, plus the headrest, which just adds to the problem, for me at least. A few hours of rest later, and I woke up with the sunrise and started to look for my breakfast.
Along with a croissant and a passion fruit Greek yogurt parfait was a Qatari spiced beef kofta with fried egg, spinach, za'atar manakis, and spiced bean stew. All delicious, but if I'm honest, the Americano and the super buttery croissant were probably my favorite things on the tray. After that, we had around an hour until landing as we cruised alongside Malaysia before passing by Kuala Lumpur. Located just to the east of the city center, we approached Changi and landed from the north. I have transited through Singapore quite a few times during COVID, but this was my first time actually entering since the pandemic began, and I was met with a painful hour-long queue for immigration. It really didn't look that long. So overall, by any other standards, a very nice flight. But by the best Qatar standards, a little bit lacking. And now onto the flip-flop score. Feel free to pause to take a closer look and a genuine thank you if you've clicked that thumbs up button and subscribe because of this video. I really do hope to see you on Sunday at the stunning and otherworldly Apoorva Kempinski Bali.